All right, so our panel is assembled. The group is as assembled as it's going to be. This is the very unenviable role of going post lunch. So Nick Parker is our next moderator. Nick Parker does have the energy to bring the attention to back to the stage. I know that. Uh, I've seen him uh, in action before and he will do it again today, I'm certain. So this third panel, third of four, is called The Restoration Economy. It's sponsored by Canada Lands and as mentioned already, it will be moderated by Nicholas Parker. So Nicholas Parker is chairman of the Clean Tech Group. It's a market leading research company that introduced the term and the concept of clean tech back in 2002. Nicholas has authored and edited more than 10 publications related to clean tech, finance, and international business, starting with investing in emerging economies in 1993. So Nick was thinking about emerging economies way before most of us. Nick is currently the chairman of Corporate Knights Media, the Blue Economy Initiative, and the Water, Tra Water Tap Corporation. He sits on several boards, including the Government of Singapore, Energy and Clean Tech Advisory Panel, and the Canadian Centre for Excellence in Commercialization of Research. So Nick is, it was on our, one of our panelists last year uh, and will uh, animate this room in the post-lunch uh, malaise that might be uh, uh, among your tables. He'll, he'll kick it back into gear for all of us. Please welcome Nick and his panel. Thank you. Well, with that kind of introduction that leaves us about four minutes this afternoon, uh, I think uh, just to warm up our hands a little bit, first of all, I, um, I've had a great lunch and I think the food was outstanding, so perhaps a round of applause. <laughs> Food for proverbial thought, of course, and uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed the morning. I could easily have a siesta now. My head is spinning from the richness of what's been put in front of us, and uh, uh, it's been, you know, deeply moving actually to see uh, the fact that we're here as as really a crowd of optimists. I used this term at a dinner last night, but I think this is going to be called the Brickworks Annual Optimists. Uh, reunion, uh, because all of us here believe in this exciting future. But I think it's as much as anything else, as I set this, uh, this panel up, which is going to be the best panel of the day because I'm a venture capitalist and I'm very competitive, so don't let me down, folks. Uh, I think uh, I'm reminded on the eve of one of the great Jewish holidays, uh, which today is, of a, a phrase that comes from the Talmud, the, the, the famous uh, of the respected uh, Jewish text, which is, we don't see the world, uh, we don't see things the way they are, we see things the way we are. And uh, hence, we need to think differently. Einstein said it's, uh, it's about posing the questions and it's about uh, how, we, how we imagine the answers. So if 80% of India, for example, in 2020, or 2030 rather, if 80% of India uh, does not exist today, then the reverse is probably true in, in the developed countries. 80% of what we have already exists. And the challenge is to restore that uh, and do that in a way that isn't just green, but is also inclusive of the other issues that matter. Jeff alluded this, this morning that environment is now part of a broader package of wellness, uh, sus uh, social sustainability, uh, and so on. So uh, here we are in the OECD with 400 plus million buildings. We've heard from Jeremy this morning about what those buildings can be. We see here a living example of what an urban landscape uh, can be that is consistent with both environmental and social sustainability. So the reason why I'm saying all this is I was thinking about the, what the word restore means. I didn't have a dictionary in front of me, but obviously it's to restore. And so what is it that's stored and we need to find out. I think it's the, the wisdom that we've always had that perhaps we lost in the last 200 years, 
with this push to efficiency and optimization. And now we're learning that we need to include resilience and diversification. So I'm trying to be a little provocative in setting up the conversation here with our four esteemed panelists. Um, we need to imagine this a little differently. As we restore, it can't just be green, it's got to be more inclusive. So in putting this panel together, we've got four really profoundly important people in this game. And uh, from left to right, uh, I talk about Tom, uh, who's on my immediate uh, left, and Tom uh, puts money to work. 750 million of it, including across five provinces in Canada, and over 35 states in the US and, and abroad. He understands what it takes to deploy capital, but from my understanding, Tom doesn't think that's good enough. So we'll hear why he feels that. Next to Tom is Dan, and even though he works at the World Bank and uh, covers the world, he's actually gonna challenge us about some statistics related to little old Toronto, uh, and put that in context too. Uh, next is Danielle. She's not a Canadian, but she was very involved in Toronto, pulling together our solar program before she migrated down to San Francisco. And uh, she's got lots to say about what San Francisco is doing to restore itself uh, uh, and, and, and hence develop a vibrant economy. And then last but not least, our good friend Celine, who's come from Ottawa, uh, uh, will tell us a lot about how technology fits into this restoration economy and will build off some of the earlier sessions we've had from today. So that's about all the speaking you're gonna get from me because after the presentations, I think it's conversation time. So get your second cup of coffee, uh, loosen up your, your mind for uh, being provocative and engaging once we have our four fire starters take us away. So Tom, first up. When I was in uh, university, I read a lot of depressing environmental books and I decided I'd try to do something about it. And I've worked for the next, for the last 30 years of my career, fundamentally in the restoration economy. But you know, I think some uh, cynicism or questioning is important as we go about our work. Like restore economy. Do we want to restore the economy that we have? The average American, every man, woman, and child now has $300,000 of government debt that they owe. That's just government debt. From a business standpoint, so, how, so at a business economic level, our businesses are overburdened with environmental regulation on the one hand, an exponential increase in regulation in the last 30 years. And yet this is how we operate. This is a uh, mercury distribution system delivering a small dose to each of those children born. This still occurs despite our regulatory environment. And yet our natural environment, our, our natural economy, this is what it looks like. We have an operation in Ethiopia, and for 80 million people, that's the environment. We can't sustain ourselves off the natural world. Turning back to nature is not the right answer. Well, what is? I started uh, Cherokee. I'll talk a little bit about my history. In 1981, I went to Bain and Company in Boston. I did energy efficiency cost reduction work. This was after I got a law degree and an urban planning master's. And uh, I learned about EPA regulation. It was affecting the wood industry. They were making them haul their waste product to landfills and burying it with six inches of dirt so it would produce the methane even more efficiently. So I bought brick plants that were just like this, in fact. They used fossil fuel energy and they were going broke because energy prices were high. And I got that wood, the sawdust, and used it as a fuel in the uh, brick operations. Worked out pretty well, but one day we discovered in 1985, that we had contamination on our sites from uh, fuel storage historically. Eventually, we found 150 underground storage tanks at our eight brick plants in Maryland, North Carolina, and, uh, and uh, South Carolina. So we started a business growing bacteria for the remediation of contaminated sites. We sold bacteria to the remediation industry, and we started cleaning up polluted sites. I realized there's an opportunity to buy them cheap, so we bought brownfields eventually starting in 1995 until now, 540 of them, US, Canada, Europe. We raised a couple of billion dollars of institutional capital for this purpose. We would buy these sites 
that look like this. This is, a, this is uh, one of the sites that we're proud to own. Doesn't look like this anymore. Our annual reports are filled with pictures like this, not beautiful pictures. And we would clean up the pollution and we would do the planning work, the entitlement work, to enable whatever was going to happen on the site next. I got a little bit introspective about that and cynical about that. And I said, well, what are people building on our sites? This used to have two feet of gasoline floating on the groundwater underneath it. And this is a, uh, you know, live, work, play, retail-ish kind of a place. They're all over the United States now. And somehow it just left me feeling a little bit uninspired. So I said, we should pursue LEED certification. We got the first LEED Platinum Award in North Carolina. North Carolina is the 10th largest state and the first or second fastest growing state in the U.S. LEED Platinum Award for this building. It uses 26% less energy than the average new building. Well, that made me feel sort of 74% bad, not 26% good. So we said, we'll do it again. We got the second LEED Platinum Award in North Carolina. And this building used 50% less energy than the average new building. Of course, I felt about 50% bad. I thought, somehow, this just isn't the right model. It also used 95% no VOC products, which meant it used 5%, I guess, VOC products. And I felt like, were we really just creating a modern version of what we bought historically? These were half bad brownfields that we were making for the future instead of bad brownfields as we bought historically. There's got to be a new model. The new model, it's not a return to nature by any stretch. We've long, long ago passed that point. But maybe it's nature as a model. Biomimicry or thinking of nature where growth is good. If that tree grows, that's not a bad thing. We need an economy where we can have growth, but it's not a material growth that negatively affects the environment. I met these guys. I'm sure a lot of you know them. It's Bill McDonough, Michael Braungart, a German chemist and an American designer, and they wrote this book, which is what you'd get if you merged two brains like that. And they envision a world where you separate material production, materials and the composites of materials, which basically would be like a building that's just a composite of a bunch of materials, into separate loops, a technosphere and a biosphere. And you keep them separated and you recycle within them, because where they cross, that's really where pollution occurs where one infects the other. And you produce all your products with renewable energy. I think it's a powerful paradigm in a way that we need to think about how growth could be good. We're putting solar panels on brownfield sites. This isn't one of ours, it's not a brownfield site. Urban brownfield distributed energy with solar panels. I acknowledge that those panels do take their first seven years to recapture the energy that it took to make the panels. So we have a ways to go with that technology. Real estate business has been pretty lousy for the last few years. We also invest in uh, venture capital money in very early stage startup mostly, clean tech companies. This is what I think is the leading uh, smart grid company. It was started in the Research Triangle Park, capturing uh, basically fruit on the ground in terms of energy efficiency. We're looking for other opportunities where maybe one plus one can equal three. Uh, I'm interested in polymer concrete from fly ash. We have hundreds of years worth of fly ash in the ground. We can recapture the rare earths and the heavy metals from that and then use it to supplant Portland cement, which produces 7% of all the CO2 that we release to the world. So I think introspection and humility is critical as we approach these issues. We're going to keep doing what we've been doing, cleaning up these polluted sites, selling them in some cases to people who do things with them that we're not particularly proud of and, uh, and uh, developing energy on these sites. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. I look forward to questions uh, at the end. Wow. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dan Hornwig. I work at the World Bank. And for those of you who don't know, see, this is cheating. I get a few extra seconds. Um, the World Bank is the world's largest development organization. Last year, we lent about 30, or sorry, 60 billion dollars, and about a third of that goes to um, urban projects. We think urban issues are one of our top three areas that we're focusing on. Um, and really, cities are, without a doubt, the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity facing humanity. Um, sustainable development can only be achieved through sustainable cities. And conferences like this, they're sprouting up all around the world. Everybody's getting sort of religion on cities because we know that that's the place that you have to make livable, sustainable to get us there. 
Now, I think this is sort of the slide that we've heard much of this morning. Um, but if there's any one thing I want to try to convince you of today is the juggernaut of urbanization is happening in the developing world. Um, to put it in perspective, every 10 days, the world is building another Toronto, a GTA. Five million people every 10 days are moving into cities. I went to um, China about 12 years ago, and I've been probably every year I go to China, and cities are sprouting up like, like, like forests almost. Um, it really is an enormous challenge, and all those cities need energy, they need food, they need resources, they generate emissions. I first went to uh, Jakarta in 1994, and, and was back there a couple months ago, and in that time, Jakarta has expanded by over five million people. Um, in 1975, there were three megacities over 10 million people. In 2030, there'll be 25 of them, 20 of them in developing countries. And this is why. This is the single most important graph when it comes to urbanization. We move to cities because that's, for me, it's where the Starbucks and the libraries are. Well, depending on the city, I suppose. Um, but cities drive our economies. There's never been a country in the history of the world that got rich without urbanizing first. Perfect example, two cities that I think there's no magic bullet when it comes to uh, urbanization. The one thing that comes closest is density. Atlanta, Barcelona, exactly the same population. That's roughly the area, that's the exact area relative to each other that they occupy. Not a surprise. Atlanta, 25 tons per capita greenhouse gas emissions. Barcelona, um, four. I've been to both cities, and if I had to choose, the quality of life in Barcelona is just as good as Atlanta, and they're doing it at a quarter of the emissions, a fifth of the emissions, and it's because of density. It matters. Here's a lovely graph, Tokyo versus Toronto. A lot of people, my parents live in Trenton because Toronto's too crowded. This is Toronto's density compared to, um, to Tokyo. Um, Ontario's places to grow legislation is one of the best in the world and why that is is because it's trying to drive density. This is, I don't want to be unfair to Toronto, but it's the only place that we have such good data. Three neighborhoods in Toronto, uh, East York, Etobicoke, Whitby, roughly the same per capita um, wealth. These are three, three neighborhoods and I have the difference in per capita residential greenhouse gas emissions are an order of magnitude. So what you buy is important, but where you live is way more important. Um, and if the whole world goes a la Whitby, we're in serious, serious trouble. Another issue that drives cities is this, this issue that we're talking about here is brownfields. Brownfields, we never used to think about them in the World Bank. But increasingly, the one on the left is, is Eastern Europe, the one on the right is China. Brownfields are very important in developing countries because the value of real estate is going up, people have more money, they're more worried about the environment. This is the only slide I'm glad you only get 20 seconds to look at. Um, this is what we're working on, trying to come up with a hierarchy of sustainability for cities. We're nowhere there yet, but, but we're trying. And, yeah, good luck. So I'm sure anybody who's been to a conference on sustainable cities has heard about Mazdar. Every place I go, Mazdar, 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 how wonderful, how wonderful. It's a parking lot. There's nothing there. Very few people have heard about Seton. If I can make one plea to the people of Ontario, please, please get Seton right. Nothing in the world, I think, can do more to push sustainable development. Top of the hierarchy, big issues, big environmental issues. You want to save the bluefin tuna today? The most important person in the world is the mayor of Tokyo. He is the person who can try and convince the city. He'll probably lose, and that's why the bluefin tuna may be doomed. Same with shark fin soup. We hear about the articles. And now at the base of the pyramid, another a gem in Toronto that most people don't know about. The global city indicator facility that the World Bank started is housed at the University of Toronto. At that base of the pyramid for sustainable cities, they need to know how to measure on a common methodology. And we're getting there. This, so, sustainable city indicators, very, very good. Um, sustainable city indexes, good luck. There's about 300 of these in the world. This is the most recent one that you've probably heard about. Toronto, I think, is number nine. They will never end, but it would be nice if they used common metrics. 
this I only put in because I really like the, the slide. Um, this is our best guess of the urban metabolism or the total material flows of the city of Amman. We want to do this for every city in the world so that we can start thinking about cities and what they use, what they consume, what they need, what they get rid of. And my last point, I really think it's time, and there's a lovely blog out that I would encourage you to read, that the world needs a league of cities. Um, where people can be innovative, companies, cities, people, where we can try new things out, a little bit like learning hospitals. We need learning cities. So with that, thank you. To steal a few of your seconds. Um, I'm Danielle Murray. I am currently from the city of San Francisco in our Department of Environment, but I was previously with the city of Toronto. Um, so down there I'm often telling them all about the wonderful things going on in Toronto, but today I'm going to try and give you some very quick snapshots of re reuse, restoration, and renewal going on in San Francisco today. Under reuse, San Francisco's mandatory recycling and composting ordinances have resulted in, wow, this is way longer than I expected, have resulted in a landfill diversion rate of 77%. It's the highest rate in the US and it's even higher than Toronto. Um, finished compost is resold for use in local gardens as well as Bay Area wineries. San Francisco was also the first city in the US to ban plastic bags from our, ret our large retailers. And our 2007 Food Service Waste Reduction Ordinance required restaurants to use compostable or recyclable takeout containers. And it's actually very hard to find a styrofoam cup in San Francisco. It always surprises you when you come across one. SCRAP, the Scrounders Center for Reusable Art Parts, and Recology's Art at the Dump Artist in Residency Program promote creative re resource recovery and reuse providing low-cost materials to educators and artists while diverting over 200 tons of material from the landfill every year. So some of our artists down in the bottom left and various parts available for reuse to teachers and whatnot. In addition to San Francisco's famed trolleys, rehabilitated uh, historic streetcars from San Francisco and other US and international cities serve residents and tourists in key downtown transit routes, along with more modern light, light rail serving the rest of the city. Fog is a constant problem in San Francisco. The other fog, fats, oils, and grease. Um, San Francisco collects and converts restaurant grease trap gunk into biodiesel at our local rendering plant, which then fuels the city's truck fleet. Um, all city vehicles, in fact, are run on biodiesel, hybrid, or hydropower from our local hydro facility. San Francisco's Pavement to Parks project reclaims underutilized under swaths of public space, intersections, and street sides and quickly and inexpensively turns them into new public plazas and parkettes, providing, as George Hazel mentioned, more exchange space rather than movement space. San Francisco has some of the most stringent standards for new residential and commercial instruction, moving towards LEED Gold certification requirements in 2012, up from regular LEED right now, as well as legislation requiring existing commercial buildings to benchmark energy use annually and conduct regular energy efficiency audits. San Francisco's retrofit on resale law um, requires property owners to conduct an energy inspection and install certain energy and water conservation features before selling their home. The new SF HIP and Net Zero Homes programs provide rebates to homeowners to upgrade drafty cold San Francisco homes, and to date we've seen energy savings averaging 33% per home and as high as 60%. Last year, our mayor challenged us to develop a plan to make San Francisco 100% renewably powered by 2020. While it won't get us all the way, local distributed renewable energy is at the core of that plan. And part of that has been the Sunset Reservoir PV project. Let's see. A massive solar installation, it's over 25,000 panels, installed on top of a covered water reservoir in conjunction with the reservoir's earthquake retrofit and a multi-billion dollar water infrastructure, infrastructure upgrade across San Francisco. Um, another 2,500 solar systems have been installed in San Francisco on our homes and businesses, largely under the Go Solar SF incentive program. Train Green SF, the city's workforce development program, prepares residents from economically disadvantaged neighborhoods for jobs in the green economy. 
workforce development hiring requirements in our Go Solar SF incentive program have put over 60 previously unemployed SF residents to work in the local solar industry. And a spin-off of the Federal Jobs Now Stimulus Program is the Environment Now Program in our Department of Environment, which again puts residents in, uh, from local disadvantaged communities into sustainability work at the Department of Environment, doing waste audits, providing energy audits at small businesses, and outreach at public events. And a different kind of city worker, uh, City Grazings, a herd of urban goats, provides natural weed control eliminating the need for toxic herbicides, chemicals, and gas-powered lawnmowers while helping restore soil fertility and providing organic fertilizer. And they're very photogenic. Hayes Valley Farm, a highway on-ramp that used to bisect the city, destroyed in the Loma Prieta earthquake of 1989, is now converted to a thriving urban farm and community space, providing food for our local food banks as well as residents who volunteer in the space. The Embarcadero Freeway, also felled in the 1989 earthquake, has been removed in favor of a streetcar right-of-way and waterfront promenade, connecting the city to its waterfront again. And the reinvented Ferry Building Marketplace, a gathering place for local farmers, artists and producers, and independent food businesses, and a visual landmark as you look down Market Street now. The historic Chronicle Building, our newspaper, repurposed as an innovation hub, shared workspace, and community space, housing social enterprises, an arts incubator, and community tech shop. Built as an, a, purpose -driven, a place for purpose-driven people to connect and build solutions for a better world. And it's one of a number of such social hubs around the city. Mission Bay, a 300-acre brownfield redevelopment of industrial and rail lands in downtown San Francisco. The development plan includes high-density, transit-oriented housing and retail space, open space along the otherwise buried Mission Creek, and a biotech and health services hub centered around the new University of California Med School campus. Heron's Head Park, a 23-acre wetland restored with the help of local youths, located at the base of our former recently shuttered power plant. And the Eco Center at Heron's Head Park, an off-grid, ultra-green environmental ed center providing educational programs to traditionally underserved neighborhoods adjacent to the recently shuttered plant which draws linkages between human health, the environment, and urban quality of life. And lastly, as we just saw, the results of the Siemens uh, Cities study. As you'll see, San Francisco came in number one, followed closely by uh, Vancouver and with San Francisco, or, uh, Toronto rounding out the top ten. So some friendly competition to leave us on. Bonjour, good afternoon, uh, buenos dias. Um, it's, it's getting to be nap time. <laughs> We're getting tired. So I thought I'd start uh, with a picture of some, some, uh, some individuals who are near and dear to my heart. They have no debt associated with them yet that I know of. <laughs> they live in Canada. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that uh, we may use uh, this image to help reframe how we think about who we can count on. I did look up a definition of restore, uh, to bring back to health, to bring back to good spirits, to introduce or to foster discipline, uh, and restore to its previous order. I think uh, in, uh, in the case of, uh, of, of our sustainable cities, and in the case of the technologies we're building uh, to contribute that, we have an opportunity right now to reconsider business as usual, to, to go beyond tweaking uh, uh, the, the way we're doing things, and we have an, a window of opportunity through which we need to, we need to pass. And that's the, the way I see things with, uh, with children. You need, to, you need to be there when it's time. I've included some images here that are not of cities, because I thought it was important for us to also think about the communities that are far from the cities and who, with, with whom, uh, well, who are our neighbors and are our co-citizens. This is a picture of, uh, of our tundra, and this is a picture of uh, a native uh, community where there's a diesel power plant, a diesel generator, sorry, right next to the, to the sort of brownfield space as well as a, a playground. Um, I, you know, there's an opportunity to reframe uh, the, these types of, uh, these uh, communities and the way we think about them and consider how Canadian uh, SMEs can create a desired picture in these settings. Um, I, I also just wanted to briefly mention that water continues to be a, an important image. 
uh, sorry, important issue on, on uh, in many communities in Canada, at any given time, there are 100 communities in Canada that are under boil water orders. So, you know, what's working, what's not working, how can we, we, we restore uh, the way we, we rely on each other and the way we consider people who take the risk to start new companies, to employ people, to make payroll every day uh, and every month, um, and to convert our investments in innovation into potential for global leadership. Um, you know, I think a big piece of that is restoring our trust uh, in our ability to work through the messiness of new ways of, ways of working. And that means working with smaller companies that, um, you know, who, who, are, who are employing our, our, uh, our neighbors and people who, uh, who, and people who take, the, take the risks to start uh, new businesses. These are, some, these are some Canadian companies that are, are working with technology that are at a, at a local scale. Um, Quantum Wind is a, is a Canadian manufacturer that, that uh, produces commercial scale wind. This is not, these are not three megawatt wind turbines, they're small 50, megawatt, 50, 50 kilowatt turbines. Uh, Hydrostore, you heard about earlier, in combination with, with uh, intermittent wind power. Uh, this technology is, is Canadian-based and, and could, I think, make a very significant contribution to uh, urban and uh, rural communities. Rigid uh, Plastics Remade by Entropex is a company that you all know because you send your rigid plastics there in your blue bin. Um, they employ people in Ontario that make re recovered plastics that go into the automotive sector. These are our neighbors that are uh, taking risks to make uh, small companies work. Um, Tarragon is a company that makes small scale um, waste management systems that, that we could use in distributed settings within, uh, within uh, ur an urban community or um, within small communities. And then um, this is a picture of uh, the results of a company, a company called LED Roadway Lighting that makes um, lighting that's 60 percent more efficient than uh, our current lighting. Um, it's a, a photograph that comes from uh, San Francisco, if I remember right. This is an SME that um, is globally competitive and making a difference around the world. I'm going to make a little transition here and, and introduce you to a company that, um, whose, whose reach will, will probably be in the developing world principally, DDI, um, Canadian rural, uh, highly technical company that uh, makes sodium oxide fuel cells that converts uh, natural gas directly to electricity and where the market is is, is uh, it, Bangladesh as an example where there isn't electricity uh, but there is uh, a lot of natural gas. This, this uh, provides me with a, a transition to uh, the, the remarks that uh, were made earlier um, uh, in regards to international financial institutions. If we take the time to actually get to know our capacity in Canada in terms of the SMEs who provide technology that can really contribute to sustainability, they are capable of taking on the world. Our own companies in this country are, uh, are, are, are accomplished exporters. Uh, they're working all over the world. We've profiled them in what I could call I get a, bit, a bit of a brag book, uh, the Canadian Clean Technology Industry Report, where you can find out about um, companies that are employing Canadians and that you can count on um, to be part of your corporate sustainability initiatives. It's a way to, you know, I'm, I'm inviting us to reframe how we think about our own SMEs um, and uh, just as in our family, we're reframing how we're thinking about the two babies at the beginning. Um, it's hard, but um, they're going to be leaving soon. Um, there's a window of opportunity. We need to walk through it and actually uh, trust our, our smaller companies in this country. They provide 60% of employment um, opportunities to Canadians. They drive a lot of the exports in our country. They're grown up and we need to take them seriously. And that means that you know, we need to consider how they can be really significant contributors to the sustainability of our cities and our communities across Canada. Thank you very much. So I was thinking while I was listening to these fantastic presentations, uh, two things. First of all, I totally misquoted Einstein when I was in an adrenaline-fueled attempt to get us kick-started. And what I meant to say earlier is we can't solve uh, problems with the same way of thinking that created them. That was the Einstein quote. Uh, but I, 
uh, as I get ready to include people uh, in the conversation, and I'm particularly looking at the people at the way at the back who think they, they can nod off and not be noticed and uh, or not very close to the coffee. So we want to make sure we bring you into the conversation uh, this afternoon. But I was thinking that really there are two things that are striking about uh, what we've heard today and particularly in this panel. And it's, it's here, those of us who are here are concerned about the environment. But there are people out there who worry about child poverty, who worry about uh, health care, who worry about education, who worry about jobs and, and so on. So how do we avoid this problem of competing for capital, competing for the, the fiscal purse that is, seems to be diminishing. And in a way, my question to you, my fellow, fellow panelists, uh, before we open up the floor is, what is it that you're seeing, what is it in the restoration economy that liberates capital, that enables us to have more, not less, to do other things that we want to do? Because if we don't get out of this kind of zero-sum game and they're competing with each other, then it's, it's going to be very hard uh, to get where we want to go. So um, uh, you know, um, I'm going to ask you, uh, Dan, to come in here for a sec because you mentioned Atlanta versus Barcelona. And I believe there's a study uh, done comparing the two cities uh, by way of illustration uh, whereby in suppressing private car ownership in Barcelona versus Atlanta, they uh, belatedly discovered afterwards that they'd actually liberated a lot of personal capital to invest in things like education and entertainment, because a car is the second most important uh, expensive thing that most of us invest in. And as a result, Barcelona has become this wonderful city that we all want to visit. Is there more evidence, Tom, Dan, uh, Dan Celine, uh, and so on, um, and Danielle, that in doing these things, we make more capital available that can be repurposed. So, uh, uh, Dan, would you care to come in on that? Um, sure. I mean, I don't want to get into a bashing Atlanta uh, phase. Um, I think the issue, I mean, maybe it's easy for me to say I work at a, at a big world bank. We have lots of funding, it seems, but we never have enough. I really agree that capital is not the issue. Um, today, the world spends about $90 billion on skin care a year. And for less than half of that, we could have every man, woman, and child in the world have clean water, enough food, a uh, roof over their head. It really is repositioning what we're spending our money on. Um, and a lot of that is, is, I think, to some extent mentioned earlier, is this, this restoration economy. Yeah, we have to restore brownfields, etc. But I think we also have to restore trust and we have to restore perspective. One, an, is, an interesting issue about Atlanta in, and what worries us from the World Bank's perspective is that Atlanta is so far gone in terms of its current development path that you can never get mass transit back into Atlanta. So if cities are building in a certain direction, once they pass a certain point, you can't restore them to where you would like. Um, you, you can see the struggle in the GTA, for example, with the transportation program that we have. It's just incredibly difficult. So in terms of the restoration economy, and maybe the automobile and transportation is a great, great sector to look at, Thinking about restoration, you also have to think about what you're building today. Okay. Uh, who else wants to come in on this question of uh, well, you know, I think, restoration? I think yeah. McKinsey's analysis of uh, you know the cost. It, it was a carbon. It was an analysis of carbon, uh, the the, uh, the the cost effectiveness of different uh, tranches of carbon reduction. But it's really uh, it's really an energy cost analysis as well. And, and I think that would tell us that there is so much low-hanging fruit or fruit that's laying on the ground, not even low-hanging. 50% plus. Yeah, I mean, right? you could get really decent returns from these investments. I've always been mystified by society's reluctance. Uh, in the early 80s when I was at Bain doing this energy efficiency cost reduction work, mostly in the steel business, people wouldn't make energy cost reduction investments unless they got a three-year payback on that. And I'd say that's a 33% return, you know, last time I got my calculator out. We don't expect that in most areas of our lives. I don't understand that very well. I think it's that people don't trust energy pricing, or they don't trust the energy efficiency is really going to be there. But I think there are great returns associated with a lot of these investments. I also think the sort of no growth scenario, I mean, it's very, frankly, very appealing to me philosophically and psychologically, personally, but I just don't think it's going to work. I just don't think it's going to work, especially not in the third world. 
We can't say you can't have, you know, some of what we have. And so I think we need ways that we can have positive economic growth that's not self that's not self destructive at the same time. I think those investments are out there. So Danielle, as coming in, I, I guess the, the the thing about growth versus no growth, particularly in the West. Uh, uh, Western world is, is probably more about materialization and dematerialization. But my question for you, Daniel, in this frame is, in doing all these wonderful things in San Francisco, has it reduced pressure on the city budget? Has it enabled you to do more things elsewhere? Well, I would say actually half the things probably that I showed on there were private sector endeavors. The city is doing really interesting things and there's public-private partnerships and a lot of them, like the parkettes, um, the, re the renovation, all of our redevelopment areas are, are public-private partnerships. Um, what percentage did the goats own of their business? All of the goats were, pu uh, were private. It's a private company that runs that on, sometimes it's the city who's hiring them for our public spaces. So does it free up our budget, some of those things? Not necessarily, but is it providing a large return to our residents, our taxpayers, in terms of quality of life? Yes. So Lynn? Yeah, uh, these new technologies, are they going to help us have more money, not less? I, I guess I was going to uh, perhaps comment on the, the creation of, the, of capital markets. I think that um, we all need to take much more accountability for the commercial success of the companies that are started in our country. Um, and if we do that, it will attract capital. It will result in exports, it will result in employment, and it will result in capital being attracted. And, uh, you know, I think you get a, you get a, a free lunch, basically, um, when you take the trouble to actually, you know, know what you have in your, in, among, in your community. Um, the other thing I would suggest is that there, there's a lot of capital on the sideways. Lineways, you know that as well as anybody, Nick. Um, and I think there are opportunities for us to reconsider how we do project finance. I mean, at the moment, project finance is a $250 million sort of hurdle, right? Well, project finance has to be you know, a different thing if we want to be able to actually implement a lot of uh, you know, the, the, the innovations that we already have. It has to become a five to $25 million sort of, you know, business. And, and we know in Canada, we have the capability to build those kinds of financial uh, services and models and to do that with the international financial institutions. Okay, so let's open it up. I guess my point is, does the restoration economy expand the pie or not? Uh, so who would like to come in and uh, provoke? I'm just going to see if there's anybody at the back before I invite uh, somebody at the front. I think there's, uh, I don't know if I can see you back there, but I can't right now, so you're going to have to get up and do this. But uh, Ursilia. Uh, microphone. I guess it's all the way at the back, is it not? Oh, there we go. There might be this one. I'd, I'd really love to know from Danielle how you managed to get the political will in San Francisco to do that. Because if you're ranked number one and we're ranked number nine and we have Rob Ford, I don't know who you have, but he's, it, you, somebody has, has done something special that we don't have here. How, how do we get him or her? Okay, so I'm going to take a bunch of questions to get people engaged and involved and then we'll parse them out, okay? So, San Francisco, how did you get it done? Celia. My question relates back to this restoration economy and coming back to a point that Jeremy Rifkin made this morning on reaching that third industrial rev revolution. I think I, as well as a lot of others, have been very Im impressed and optimistic about the, the collection of projects and investments that are happening. But I think the point he made this morning was it has to be more than just a collection of independent projects. If any one of those pillars, he argued, uh, falls down, we can't reach that next stage. And so I'd like to ask this panel, you know, as you're looking at mobilizing markets and investment, how, a challenge of that theory, if you will, or if you also believe that we have to go beyond just independent, you know, highly mobilized, optimistic projects to we have to invest huge sums of dollars, energy investment on renewables and storage and uh, the smart grid and all the you know other things that e equal together. Versus well, uh, let, let, you can't just pose a question like that uh, when you work for Summerhill Group and do all the work you do. You must have some of the answer. Well, how would you answer the question? Come on. Put me on the spot. Yes, absolutely. Everybody's well, on the spot here. So, so I, I fundament, my perspective is I, I agree with that. You know, when, when Jeremy put forward that 
uh, that position, it was something that really resonated. I hadn't actually thought about the issue in that way, but I think that there's, there's a big maybe policy issue that needs to be addressed here, which is that you can't just look at these things independently. You can't just pick apart the Green you know, Economy and Energy Act on renewables without looking at uh, smart grid and storage and some of these other pieces. And I think that's a big missed opportunity uh, perhaps from a policy and a political perspective. And I'm not sure the answer, but okay. I, you know, I fundamentally believe we have to address that key thing, which is we seem to be unable to bring these things all together towards a broader vision. Okay, one more question and we'll bring the panelists back in. Who else wants to get up here? Where's the mic? Somewhere, somehow. Uh, I think, Doug, you're next. Yeah, you already yeah. had a mic, so we're okay. Okay, just a quick one. Uh, every time I come to one of these things, I hear about good ideas and great things happening in different places. And I'm just wondering, if there aren't different ways or better ways of sharing practices and stories amongst uh, cities around the world, if cities are where it's at, um, how do we uh, sort of get cities to play off each other's energies better and faster, trade those lessons learned, and maybe, Dan, that's what you were thinking of with your League of Cities, but uh, maybe you could expand on that. Okay, and uh, Jeff, you're going to love that question, I'm sure, because that's part of what Brickworks is, and Evergreen is planning to work on. So. Three great good questions. San Francisco, how'd you get it done? And anybody else can answer this. Um, how do we actually engage in more system, systemic thinking and how do we encourage that get out of our silos? And then how do we increase the collective metabolic rate of learning? So uh, why don't we let San Francisco start first and everybody can come on in. Um, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. We're very lucky in San Francisco to have the political will to do a lot of this innovative work. Um, it comes from our politicians, but it also comes from the community. And I, I think that has to do with our history of you know, Hippie Hill and Hayden Ashbury and a combination of that and Silicon Valley being right there. So it's a sort of unique situation and confluence. Um, and it allows us to do a lot of really fun, interesting, innovative work in the city. Um, how do you get that here? I mean, I think you saw some innovative stuff happening when you had a strong mayor like David Miller in the past doing a lot of that, that work, um, but you need your downtown to speak up and get more politically engaged. Um, and just to the, the second part of uh, the question over there, cities have a, a huge role to play in, in shifting the economy, and just to give an example of where we're not doing enough, we're spending about $5 billion on waste, or on waste water and water upgrades to our infrastructure system, which is dearly needed. But at the same time, we're spending $5 million on renewables. So it's piecemeal, and we have a role to play in switching that equation. Uh, gentlemen, do you want to come in on these questions? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll try the, well, maybe combining the third, Get the, mic up a the, little. third and the second. Um, I think, I think if you, want to, if you want to really change the world, you have to change it through cities. Cities are the, the optimum size to do things of scale, but yet to do them with the community. And I'm always struck by the fact that in the world there's about 550 registered teaching hospitals. So if you want to be a doctor, you have to go through one of those teaching hospitals. And there's not a single teaching city in the world. And we spend well over 10 times as much money on infrastructure in cities than we do on healthcare. So I would propose, maybe, um, something like a, a learning group of cities where 50 to 100 cities come together around the world, ones that need lots of restoration, ones that are rapidly growing, and maybe the same number again of, 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 of forward-thinking companies, and in those cities maybe partner with groups like the Global City Indicator Facility, maybe parts of C40, ICLEI, whatever it is, but use those cities as a way to learn. And as a, as a Canadian, I would just hope that there's one in Canada, and if there's any one that it should be, it should be Toronto. But we're not going to do this one city at a time, one project at a time. We really have to go to scale quickly, and the way to do that, I think, is through cities. Well, but, but you're lending tons of money at the World Bank. You've got people coming at you left, right, and center for different projects, different areas. Are you finding receptivity to A, systems thinking, B, are you managing to port what you learn in Buenos Aires over to, you know, uh, Ho Chi Minh? Uh, you know, if you're not able to do it, who is? Well, I think the only people who are able to do it are the cities. I mean, we all love to talk about systems thinking, but, you know, this morning I heard about all these renewable energies, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Ontario spends roughly half the amount, or 
yeah, our cost of electricity is half what it is in the OECD average, and lo and behold, we use twice as much as the OECD average. So I think it's a, it's not just systems thinking, it's, it's what are we going to do in a city like San Francisco or a city of, of Toronto, actual specific things that then can be scaled up quickly. The capital is out there. The World Bank will support it, the Asian Development Bank, the TD banks, everybody. But what it needs, I think, is this scale and this rapidity that you can get through a city. Um, and, and the challenge will be how you get a bunch of cities working together, like a Toronto, as well as a Buenos Aires, as well as a Kinshasa. They, they have a very difficult language talking to each other. That's where city indicators are a good place to start. But to be able to get these cities really pushing the envelope, I think, is a, is a big start. Well, I'm astonished with the alphabet soup of organizations that are meant to bring cities together that this is still <laughs> a challenge. But, Tom, um, no comment on this one? Uh, Salim, do you want to come on on this? I guess the only thing I would say is that um, in Toronto, political capital will come with jobs. And if you want to gather political capital, you have to do that through some you know, relationship between sustainability and jobs. And the thing that I think we need to bear in mind in all this conversation is that SMEs, our own innovation-based companies, innovation-based companies from around the world, they bring jobs into the equation. And so for someone like Rob Ford, you know, to the extent that you can express the opportunity in terms of jobs, then it, it will resonate. In Canada, we have 44,000 people working in sustainable SMEs clean tech SMEs, and that could grow to 125,000 people. That's bigger than the aerospace industry. It's important. But politicians, they're coin operated, right? You know, a vote is a job. So we need to connect the two. All right, thanks. Um, others who want to come on in? I see one person right here. Everybody at the back, are you still sleeping back there? What's going on? All right, going to pick on somebody back there soon. Yeah, maybe, maybe just a question on the Atlanta uh, versus Barcelona. You just if Atlanta is too far Did gone. You introduce it, yourself. Oh yeah, Thomas George. I'm with TD um, TD Asset Management. Uh, just uh, maybe the, the question is. It just sounds it, that sounds really sad. Actually, the fact that Atlanta is too far gone, and uh, it, like maybe the Atlantas and the Whippies of the world. Like, can they have an organization? Like, is there any thinking uh, about you know how we can how we can make that more sustainable and maybe the next question on the restoration side is what about the abandoned cities like I think of Buffalo's come to mind that that probably have the good infrastructure in terms of tightly packed and you know more so but they just don't have the economic activity if there's any thinking like Detroit is a great example too so just a couple of thoughts and ideas maybe from the panel Tom you've worked in a lot of places around the world that have people have abandoned so yeah those cities get abandoned not because of their physical structure it's because of their emotional and human infrastructure so it's government policy it's the nature of the place that drives business away and and they won't go back as long as those policies are there people aren't going to set up businesses in states like Michigan because the economic policies are so uh, uh, discouraging a business type activity so you end up in sort of a doom loop but it has nothing to do with like the structure of the city I don't think the city can make it happen it's at a broader level like at a state policy level you know vis-a-vis -vis Atlanta I live in an area that's that's not too different in some ways Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill the Research Triangle Park of North Carolina and and there is a lot going on with people trying to find ways that will work in that setting the reason that, that, this, that the comment was it won't work in an Atlanta is that you have so much physical infrastructure that's basically blocking it from occurring. And I think you get to a certain point. When I say it, I mean changing the way transportation works, changing the way housing works. You have, you have other houses that are built in the wrong place to, to, uh, to the, the, in effect, blocks where you would want to have density. And I think over time that changes as the incentives or the motivations or the economics change and they start to put in transit systems they start to urbanize they start to get uh, more density even in those markets but it is a, a deep burden that we carry it's an energy burden it's an inefficiency burden that we carry because of our physical structure that we've built Dan you know you talked about maybe you know I, I don't think it was quite what you meant to say that you know you sort of give up on a place like Atlanta you can't reform it, when you look at what they've done in Seoul or in Boston with the you know, various things, is that what you really meant? That you, you can't unwind 
that no, 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 not at all. Okay. I mean, I don't want to. I don't know. Hope there's nobody from Atlanta. My only point about Atlanta was that the spread of population in Atlanta will make it almost impossible to put in, say, a, a large-scale mass transit. So Atlanta will always be challenged by its its cost of infrastructure. There's not much other way to get around Atlanta than by driving. So if if we start having a, a cap on on um, carbon emissions, Atlanta is going to pay a much higher price than other cities. But we see already in cities like Detroit, we're seeing strategic retreat where the city is saying very wisely to large swaths of the city, we will not provide services in this area. They're abandoning it. And, and the, in 10, 20 years, Detroit will come back. Um, but it will be a very difficult process. So I don't want to give up on any city, and I think it really does boil down to the policies, but some cities, we see cities being built today in, 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 in places like China or, or parts of India, where we know that the infrastructure systems being put in place are so challenging to get below low carbon emission cities that we're going to have a very difficult time. And that's still the direction that we're heading in many cities. Any thoughts on this or bring more people in? Five minutes to go. Uh, Mr. Jansi. I was struck by the comment that some of the rebuilding in San Francisco or, or restoring came after the earthquake. I'm struck by the fact that Christchurch, New Zealand is looking to rebuild itself as the most sustainable city in the world. So maybe we need a good old natural disaster to get things going. But short of that, um, I'm a downtown guy in Toronto, and I'm wondering whether or not you say you need the political will here, here to do things. Is Toronto just too big? And do we need to look at a de-amalgamation? Uh, so the city of Toronto, which I, I think in some ways uh, could gather the political will to do many of these things, and then be an example to, the, to other communities and then to be guild, begin to build those nodes. Is that something that we need to begin to consider as a restoration catalyst? Okay, one more question because we're running out of time. If there is any, otherwise, uh, uh, right here at the front, Mr. Jim. Just picking up on what Celine said, that uh, jobs are the currency of Mr. Ford. Um, here in Ontario, um, for our American friends they might not know, we're planning to spend $33 billion on more nuclear plants, which if we spent half that much on retrofitting energy efficiency, we'd create as much energy saving as the nukes would produce, and they'd do it right away, not in 10 years from now. And uh, we'd create 10 times more jobs, uh, and not just in Darlington, but all throughout the province. And uh, so how do we spin that with the uh, political masters? Okay, so I'm hearing two questions. What's the right scale to get effective action, whether you're building uh, SME clusters or new ideas? And uh, how, do we, how do we get the messaging right that um, uh, a new way of seeing things actually gets us better results? Uh, I'm going to ask all of you to uh, come in on that. And Celine, let you start off. Thank you. Um, I think there's repetition, very important. Um, you know, I, and I think we need to create forums that are perhaps ad hoc, uh, where we we put together simple messages and we, you know, repeat <laughs> a lot. I think what you just said, Jim, is something that you know would resonate, but it needs to be expressed in a way which makes sense for individuals in all their different roles. We're, at the moment, we're we're repeating on Parliament Hill in Ottawa. Uh, you know, the message about jobs and about sustainability and our capacity in terms of innovation and our responsibility to change how we think about younger companies in this country. It takes a lot of repetition. I, 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 at, at that level, you know, it's a bit dull and boring, but it, it is actually absolutely necessary. We're not, we're not going to be successful otherwise. Danielle. Um, just to follow on that, there was a recent study in the States of um, messaging around climate change and one of the interesting outcomes was that Republicans market and Democrats study. So Democrats tend to, to focus on the science and keep working on the studies and getting it right where Republicans market what, whatever they want. So translate, as that, <laughs> translate that as you will to Canada but um, you know there's something 
to learn there about how we put out the message about climate change, sustainability, other environmental and urban planning initiatives. Um, go ahead, I'll pass it on for now. Um, okay, I'll take a shot at the Toronto and the scale and Toronto's place in the world. Um, Toronto just dropped out of the top 100 largest cities in the world. Um, so goes Toronto, so goes Canada, I think. Um, and that if one is to look at Toronto, the challenge of Toronto is how you, how you add up 416 and 905 and get a bigger number than those two together. Um, and I think Toronto has the, it not only has the ability, I would say that today Toronto is leading in many, many areas globally. And I think that there's a, an enthusiasm and a capacity in Toronto, Young and Eglinton, where I have a house, or, or, or Whitby, or, or wherever it may be, that can be, that can be channeled and marketed globally, whether it's through our SMEs or whether it's through our large companies. I think we still have to figure out how to do that, but I think Toronto has an extremely um, positive future. I don't know if that helps. Well, just to comment on this nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, uh, electricity production versus megawatt kind of analysis, I find that so painful, yet it's so true. Um, I heard a speaker recently, I was, I was back at law school, and uh, there's a professor uh, named Dan Cahan, Cahan or Cahan, K-A-H-A-N, at uh, Yale, who's written about how we incorporate scientific data into our decision-making process. He's focusing on things like climate change, but other issues as well. And he's concluded, he and other scientists studying this have concluded that we're basically much more affected by what the people around us believe than we are by the actual data. And this effect is magnified as people become more scientifically and more mathematically literate. All right, so it goes the opposite direction you would think. You'd think that smarter people would be better at taking data and making good decisions from it. Actually, smarter people are better at figuring out what their friends believe. And so I think it's really a sad situation, but I think the answer to that question is you gotta be really careful about who's speaking out on these different issues. Because the minute some people speak out, then the people who are not friends with those people, friends broadly defined politically, socially, economically, then they'll oppose it. And we're seeing it so violently in the United States now. I think it, it could be our fatal flaw. How do we get beyond that? How do these issues become politicized? Why does a group of people just love nuclear power, irrespective of what the data might say? I find this issue just uh, you know, frustrating beyond belief, but I, I think it is the critical issue that we have to resolve, because we have to get into a situation where we're using data and analysis and reality to make these decisions, and not emotions really on each side. Well, so here we are at this stage of the, uh, the day, and I think we've heard that it's really, really challenging to get uh, the kind of momentum around restoration, even though there are good examples. We know the technology is there, so maybe we have to reimagine things and design things differently, which sets us up for the next panel. But before Jeff comes up, a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you.